the charge, I guess, that was given to me was to be short, and I will try to do so. The, um, as many of us know, there's been a lot of changes with regards to rural lands, and so what I'm going to talk about is what we're seeing as we drive across the state with regards to changes of our farms and ranches and family forests. And again, I, I'm going to try to be short. Uh, much of the data that I'm going to share with you today uh, comes from a project that we call Texas Land Trends. It's a project that our institute's been involved with for, for several years. And it draws on two primary data sets, uh, the county tax appraiser data, as well as the uh, uh, census of ag data, which is conducted every five years. It just got uh, surveyed this uh, recently, or this year. And so um, between those two data sets, as well as a Texas landowner survey that we conducted a few months ago. I'd like to talk about changes in land value, ownership and land uses, and the definition for, for my presentation of working lands are farms and ranches and family forests, so lands that fall into 1D and 1D1 lands. So three things. I'm going to start with the fact that we've got more people in the state, and as Lori alluded to earlier, uh, that uh, uh, is only going to continue. You know, we've got 171 million uh, acres of land in our state. 95% of Texas is privately owned. Uh, a, a probably a more important statistic, at least to me, is the fact that 83% of Texas is a farm, a ranch, a family forest. 83%, 142 million acres, and 26 million Texans benefit from these farms, ranches, and family forests. Uh, when you look at where Texans live, almost 85% of Texans live in an urban center, a uh, Houston, a San Antonio, uh, an Austin. About 10%, 15% of Texans live in a, a rural community. And uh, that one little icon there, about 1% of Texans own 83% of these rural lands. So uh, again, they play a real important part with regards to the stewardship of these lands. And looking at the land trends data, in the last 15, 20 years, we've seen an increase in the human population, going from 19 million to 26 million. We're adding about a half a million people to our roster every year. Uh, most of the growth in our state is occurring in, in the, these top 10 counties that are highlighted here. Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, Houston, uh, the Valley, and uh, El Paso. So that's what's happened in the last 15 years. Looking forward, if uh, traffic is not too good where you live, it's going to get worse. Um, <laughs> the bottom line assumes no change in, in migration. Uh, that's not happening in our state. The middle line assumes half of what we saw the last 10 years, a more plausible scenario. And the top line assumes uh, the same level of people moving to the state, uh, probably a, a realistic scenario. And so we're going to go from about 26 million people to about 55 million people in the next uh, several decades, by 2050. A lot more people. And when you look at Texans, there's two types of Texans. There's a, an urban Texan, people that live in Houston and Austin and, and Dallas, Fort Worth as well as Texans that live in these rural communities. And there's a shift in those demographics. More and more people are living in these urban cities or centers. And one of the reasons why people are moving to Texas is the fact that we're blessed in the state and having a real strong economic driver or engine. And more and more people are, are moving to the state for those reasons. You know, oil and gas is a, a real big driver for this. I'm going through this fairly quickly because, again, the fact that there's barbecue sitting over there, uh, don't, don't want to uh, endanger my life in any way. This sli slideshow is actually uh, available on our website, and at the very end, I'll, I'll uh, put that up there. Um, in 2011, 2010, we saw a real uptick in oil and gas production due to changes in, in uh, fracking or, sh uh, or shelf lay activity. And even though with the downturn in recent years, it's still uh, fairly high. And so again, 
You look at oil and gas market value in 1997, the hotter the color on the left versus in 2012. You know, there's uh, some areas of the state where market value of these rural lands are, is, is fairly high. Uh, so the Permian Basin, uh, as well as, um, as uh, Eagle Ford Shell. I, I like this satellite image. This is a nighttime uh, image taken um, that basically captures nightlife, okay? And what you see is 1992 and 2012, and then the big map is a subtraction of that signature. And so what you see is an increase in nighttime illumination over that 15 or so year period. And so you see the urban sprawl around Dallas-Fort Worth, you see Austin, you see San Antonio, you see I-35, you see Houston. And for those that don't know where the Eagle Four Shell is, it, it uh, pops up real well right there. So, first part of my presentation, we got more people and it's gonna get worse, okay? I oftentimes like telling people, I'm not telling you anything that you didn't already know probably, but uh, it's always good to see numbers and start to see trends that you see as you drive around Texas. The fact that, I'm gonna go back, that we have more people, greater demand, there's less farms and ranches, and these kind of signs are becoming commonplace in our state. And, and I like this graph because it basically shows the process in terms of development. You've got a, a strong uh, economy, an increase in population, an increase for, for demand for rural land, higher land values, an incentive to subdivise or fragment, and ultimately it converts into a strip mall, into a subdivision, and so forth. That's the process. It happens all across the United States. So in looking at the last 15 years, and looking at our land trends data, we've lost uh, a, a little over a million acres of rural lands, farms, ranches, family forests. So this is uh, due to conversion. When you look at market value, uh, we've seen a gain and this is statewide, uh, a little over $1,000 acre, $1, per acre statewide. You look at that map, the hotter the color, the higher the value. So some of these areas in and around these urban centers, you, we're seeing four to $5,000 plus increases in value. And so again, that's a big driver to fragment, divide those uh, properties into smaller properties, and event, eventually that uh, converts. So this map basically shows you where fragmentation has occurred in the last 15 or so years. Uh, we have actually have seen an addition of 25,000 new farms and ranches due to this fragmentation. So uh, about four and a half million acres have been impacted. I like this graph because what it does on the bottom axis, it shows you the operation size. And it may be hard to see for those in the back, but uh, you go from, on the far left, less than 10 acres to greater than 2,000 acres in terms of the average farm or ranch. And there's a breaking point, and that breaking point's about 140 acres. Anything less than 140 acres on average, you're losing money on that farm or ranch. And so that's one of the, the challenges when you break up that farm or ranch, it, it's uh, hard to make a living off that property. I talked about this number earlier, uh, in the last 15 or so years, we've seen an increase in ownership size, particularly in operations uh, less than 100 acres. And lastly, uh, this slide here shows you two things. It shows you uh, where size matters and location matters, okay? The, the blue line at the top basically is rural land prices for the last 40 plus years. And these are actual rural land sales uh, collected by the Real Estate Center at, at A&M. The solid line is um, small tract lands, less than uh, 100 acres. The dash line is greater than 280. And so what you see is blue line is the hill country and the red line is West Texas. Same difference in terms of small versus large. Um, though they're defined slightly differently. And uh, location matters. So hill country lands have increased much faster than West Texas lands. And within a given region, smaller tracts on average sell for greater, a greater value than, than larger tracts. 
And that's the reason why people subdivide oftentimes many properties, okay? Oftentimes I'm blamed for, for being the, the bearer of bad news. All you do is talk about fragmentation and the doom and gloom of Texas. There are still parts of Texas that are wide open spaces. So, so the next couple of slides are, are kind of the, the, the reverse of what I've just showed you. So this is the average farm size. Where, where in Texas do we have large tracts of land? The darker the color, the, the larger on average, and you know, the dark green there is greater than 5,000 acres, as you would expect, that's uh, in West Texas. Uh, this uh, map shows you where we've seen a decrease in the population. So we've actually have seen loss of population numbers in those counties. Again, the, the darker the color, that's where we've uh, seen those changes. And remember I showed you that nighttime illumination uh, satellite imagery, this is uh, where these counties are real dark. So pretty isolated uh, counties in terms of nighttime illumination. And then the last uh, uh, slide or map here that I, I'll show you is counties where they have very little developed land. So they're rural counties, they're, they're natural cover types, they're uh, 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 range lands, they're, they're forest lands or what have you. And again, primarily in West Texas and parts of the Permian Basin and so forth. So this is kind of a collection of those three, of those uh, four or five maps, and it shows you what counties, in this case it's Culberson County, so if you're interested in going off the grid and you wanna live in a real rural county, that's uh, the county that you can uh, go to. Of course, people that live in Culberson County probably don't appreciate me showing this slide. <laughs> All right, the, the last uh, uh, piece of my presentation is, you know, I've talked about the fact that we're, we're going to have more people in the state. That's going to impact our farms and ranches through fragmentation and conversion. Now I'd like to shift gears and talk about landowners. And a lot of what we're talking about here today is the value of conservation easements as a tool with regards to conservation. And that's important, particularly when you look at the changes in landowner demographics. The average farmer in our country is 57 years old. The average forest landowner is 65 years old. And our country, many parts of our, our, of our the United States and our state are about to see the largest intergenerational transfer of, of land in its history. I'll say that again. We're about to see the largest land transfer we've ever seen in the history of our country. And it's happening now, and it's been happening for about five to 10 years. And so the question then is, what's the new landowner gonna look like? What's their driver? What are their goals and objectives? New ownership is about 25%. Uh, absentee ownership is about 40, uh, 40 to 50%. Um, and one of the things we did uh, recently in partnership with Texas Parks and Wildlife, the Private Lands Advisory Committee, was to try to better understand this, and we did a, a statewide survey. And though, uh, you know, again, we got about 3,100 responses. Uh, the, the dark colors there are where most of those responses were, um, or where we got survey responses from. There are parts of the Panhandle and West Texas that are that we're missing, but it gives us some insight in terms of um, you know what's on the minds of landowners. And so I'm going to go through some of those uh, slides, and then uh, we'll all uh, mosey over to the barbecue. How's that sound? All right. First slide, and boy, it took 10 years for me to make this slide. About half of our, our, our landowners live in Houston, living in Austin and in San Antonio. They're absentee landowners. That, what that means is they live in an urban center. They don't live on that farm or ranch. The question is, how far do they drive to that farm or ranch? So this is landowners that live in Houston. This is where their farm or ranch is located. For San Antonio, this is what that looks like, the spider graph. Uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, they all kind of go to the hill country, don't they? I want to just pick a, a couple of different questions from this survey. Uh, this question asked, what are the reasons for owning land? What's your driver, goals and objectives? 
Hunting, wildlife, and family were some of the, the primary reasons for owning a farm or ranch for some of our landowners. This map shows you uh, wildlife valuation trends. In, in Texas, in 1995, uh, a law was passed where you can maintain your ag valuation if you manage for wildlife. And so if, between 1997 and 2012, we've seen a gain of about 3.2 million acres of, of uh, farms and ranches enrolled in, in uh, wildlife valuation. And, and we expect this trend to only continue. Uh, you can see the, from the map there where many of those farms and ranches are, are uh, located. This uh, graph, or question, ask the question, how, how uh, what's your sources of income from your property? And I make the distinction here uh, between absentee and resident. Uh, ranching is a, a primary source of income. No income is uh, something that many landowners own it for different reasons. So they're not necessarily making uh, a living completely on the on their property. They own it for for family, for wildlife, for recreational reasons, and so forth. This um, question says, in the next 10 years, how likely are you to transfer your land to a family or loved one? And I make the distinction here between millennial and other. Millennial basically being landowners less than 40 years of age and other being veterans, so over 40 years of age. And uh, when you look at the very likely to the far right, you see that uh, older landowners, it's on their mind. They're thinking, you know, I'm, I'm trying to prepare for uh, passing of the baton, if you will. And speaking of passing the baton, uh, last slide here, just on time. How about that? Um, so to summarize, what we're seeing in our state with regards to effects of fragmentation and conversion is the fact that we have more people coming to our state, we have an increasing population and that numbers and trends only gonna continue. Uh, we have shifts in demography in terms of going from a rural to more urban Texan. And so one of the challenges for us is, is trying to sort of connect urban Texans with the value of farms and ranches. Many of you obviously see the value of those farms and ranches and family forests or you wouldn't be here today, but there's a, uh, uh, certainly a lot of work to be done there. Uh, more, more people, greater demands on our, our uh, farms and ranches will obviously result in an increase of fragmentation of those ranches and farms in certain parts of the state and ultimately conversion. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a changing landowner demographic. That's probably something that's the, the most interesting thing that, that we're seeing different set of objectives, and so trying to better serve those uh, future landowners is something that we're looking to try to do in all the work that we do. There's many folks here with uh, land trusts, uh, NGOs, uh, state and federal agencies, and, and we're all in this together. And so with that, uh, that's our institute's website. TexasLandTrends.org has uh, some of the information that I've shared with you here. And you can actually look up uh, some of the data by county or region if you're interested. There's a, a, a little tool there, a data tool that you can, you can play with. So with that, Marianne, I've got five minutes, That's right? So any questions before we break loose for, for barbecue? So the, the comment, just to uh, rephrase, is um, you know one, one uh, unforeseen impact of fragmentation uh, is, is the fact that it impacts wildlife populations, you know, particularly larger 
uh, wildlife populations, you know, black bear, uh, uh, prairie chickens, you know, the, I've done work with prairie chickens and when you look at prairie chickens uh, in the Katy Prairie and, and, and other parts of, of, um, of this part of Texas, that's really one of the, the big drivers with pinnated grouse is the fact that they just need large spaces to operate. And so when you start to fragment those landscapes and so forth, it's really hard to maintain those type of populations. Great, great comment, thank you, sir. So does your um, company have any program in place to reduce fragmentation? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of the question. Does your company have any programs in place to reduce fragmentation? Yeah, the question is, uh, d does uh, our group have any programs in place to uh, reduce fragmentation? You know, for, for us, we're a university, and so part of what we try to do is tell the story and, and understanding what the drivers are for fragmentation and so forth, and then working with organizations like uh, the, the KPC and, and others to, again, put tools in, in a place. So um, it's, it's through education, information sharing that, that hopefully we can make a difference. Well, uh, can, we, can we add the fact that a lot of the information that Royal's group has put together actually helped us get funding from the Texas legislature through their farm and ranch land protection program. And without that kind of information showing that it increased water resources without lots of extra money, kept land and ag, we really wouldn't have been able to convince the legislators to give us the first two million. And the hope is, is that as we go back to them over and over and over again, they're going to grow that. And a lot of the people who get money from the um, 